Um, so we thought, uh, let's do something where the audience afterwards knows everything from the start to the end about uh, row hammer attacks. How to uh, perform row hammer attacks um, and also what related work is there. So a sort of a walkthrough guide uh, through a game uh, or we thought of it like a movie, row hammer the movie. So, my name is Daniel Gruss. I'm currently a PhD student at Graz University of Technology. You can reach me via Twitter or email. And, uh, and my name is Clementine Maurice. I'm a postdoc at Graz University of Technology. You can also join me on Twitter or via email. So, as Daniel said, the goal of this talk is that you get really a comprehensive overview of Rohammer attack because there have been a lot of them in the past last two years. And also that you can run the tools on your own machine and that uh, also importantly that you understand what's happening and why it's happening. So that if something doesn't work then uh, you know that nothing is black magic and maybe you can configure something and then it works. Um, so we will start with a bit of background on DRAM and on Rohammer. Uh, also then explain you uh, step by step first how can we flip bits uh, using Rohammer, then how can we exploit those uh, bit flips and how can we vindicate uh, Rohammer before concluding. So we're starting with the background. Okay, so uh, if we want to talk about Rohammer first, of course, we have to talk about uh, how is DRAM organized. And all of us know such a DRAM module, so you see the chips there. And uh, these DRAM modules, typically you have multiple of them in your system, and the CPU operates them in separate channels. And these channels can operate uh, simultaneously, so they work in parallel. So you can double the uh, throughput of your DRAM uh, with that. Um, also, the DRAM modules have multi multiple sites, and these sites are usually called ranks. Um, so here we have uh, two sides and we have rank 0 and rank 1. There are also DIMMs with more ranks, but we won't go into detail here. Let's look at a chip instead. A chip is uh, subdivided into multiple banks and these banks are then subdivided into multiple rows. Each row is typically 8 kilobytes and stores uh, th these 8 kilobytes of single bits uh, in physical uh, DRAM cells. To access one of those rows, we have to activate the row, and when we activate the row, it is copied to the row buffer. And we will look at that uh, in detail. So, uh, when the CPU wants to access row 1, which is highlighted here in orange, uh, you can see that the row first is activated, and then it is copied to the row buffer. And then the value from the row buffer is returned to the processor. Now, if the CPU wants to access a different row, for instance, row 2, you can see it has to switch the row. So now in the row buffer, you can see there's still the orange content, but it wants to fetch the green content from row 2. So row 2 is activated, and with uh, this, it is also copied to the row buffer. This is, of course, much slower than uh, fetching something uh, which is already stored in the row buffer. So if the CPU wants to again access row 2, we will just go through this example, then row 2 is already in the row buffer and then uh, it will be a so-called row hit. So here we have the difference between a row hit and a row conflict, uh, which is very much comparable to a cache miss and a cache hit. So here basically the row buffer plays the role of a cache. The DRAM cells, um, we, we ha have, of course, uh, constraints from the physical world. So if, if you come from a software perspective, you think, of course, uh, hardware is perfect and has no errors and everything just works. But in practice, uh, these cells uh, leak their charge over time and therefore you have to uh, refresh the content of those cells uh, repetitively. So you, uh, what you do is you read the data from the DRAM cells into the DRAM row buffer and then you write the same data back into the DRAM cells and with this step you refresh the content that is in the DRAM. Now this is a slow step because while this happens you cannot really access any other rows in the DRAM so you want to reduce the uh, number of refreshes to a minimum and then the DDR4 and DDR3 standards they define a uh, maximum interval between refreshes uh, to still guarantee data integrity and the DRAM manufacturers have to build their cells in a way that they can comply with this standard. Uh, the cells of course uh, have more effects. And one effect, we can exploit that in the so-called row hammer attack, is that cells leak faster upon proximate accesses. So if you access uh, two neighboring cells, uh, the 
surrounding cells will leak that charge faster and then uh, we might have a race against the next uh, refresh here, whether the next refresh will be fast enough before the cells lost their charge. And with that we come to the row hammer attack. The row hammer attack, uh, motherboard Vice described it like, it's like breaking into an apartment by repeatedly slamming a neighbor's door until the vibrations open the door you were after. So it's exactly what we're doing here. So we want to uh, change a bit in the middle row that is uh, colored in white between the orange and green row and we activate those two rows alternatingly and it's, they are always copied to the row buffer. And if we do that long enough, we will have bit flips in row two. So this is how it generally should work, but uh, activating a DRAM row, that is not a uh, function that we can just call, so we have to see how we can do that. So in order to have these bit flips, uh, we have several requirements. So first, memory accesses must, must be uncached. They have to really reach the DRAM, uh, else we don't have this effect on the DRAM. Uh, we also need to have lots of them in a very short time because this is really a race against the next row refresh. We need to have as many accesses between two row refreshes. And then they also need to be quite targeted because we need to reach these two specific rows to have then the bit flips uh, in, in the middle. So the first question is how do we get enough uncached accesses? Here the CPU cache plays quite an important role because this is between the CPU core and the DRAM. So if you just do these naive uh, accesses, then they will all stay in the cache and they will never reach the DRAM. So it will never work. So only non-cached accesses reach the DRAM. And you basically have two strategies to have these non-cached accesses. Either you uh, put data in the cache and then you have to remove data from the cache, or you just don't put it there in the first place. Uh, so that the next access will actually be served from the DRAM. And there are four different access techniques that I'm going to go through now. So the first one was uh, the original Rohammer paper by Kim et al. in 2014, and they used the serial flush instruction to remove data from the cache. Uh, then we use cache eviction, uh, also a wicked al. used cache eviction to remove data from the cache, and then in the part that Basically, that don't put it there in the first place. There are uh, non-temporal accesses by Xiao et al. and also uncached memory by Van der Wien et al. So the first technique is hammering with the CL flush instruction. So basically, as we said, so when you access data from the DRAM, it goes into the cache. So this is here in green. Um, what you can do is call the CL flush instruction. And what the CL flush instruction is going to do is that it's going to remove data from the cache. So it's not there anymore. And we can then reload data put it there in the cache, and so on. So flush, reload, flush, reload, flush, reload, until we have our bit flips right in the middle, in the DRAM. So now this was done, the original study was done on DDR3, and the authors um, seek to see how widespread is this issue. So they tried 129 um, modules from three different vendors, and they basically uh, see that all but three were vulnerable um, from modules that were manufactured since mid-2011. Also, Siebert and Julian from Google tried on 29 laptops, and so the half were vulnerable. Um, but until then, um, basically DDR4 was believed to be safe because it's a different manufacturing process. Also, some vendors incorporated some countermeasures in there. Uh, but we actually showed that if you still hammer in a different way, then you can still have some bit flips. So the problem is really not done uh, yet, not solved. So as I said, um, basically Rohammer, you do flush, reload, flush, reload, flush, reload. And this is essentially a flush and reload uh, attack. And flush and reload, for the one that are not familiar with it, it's a cache attack. Uh, so from our perspective, it's actually as much an attack on the theorem as it is one on the cache. So we basically thought, OK, so we can um, avoid this CL flush instruction to be independent of this specific instruction, since basically you have no CL flush instruction in JavaScript, for example. So our approach was to use regular memory accesses to evict data from the cache and not use this CL flush instruction. And this is techniques from cache attacks. So basically we're doing, uh, we are going to do Rohammer not with flush and reload cache attack, but with prime and probe cache attack. So it works like this. Again, um, we have access data from the DRAM. It goes into a cache set. And what we're going to do now is that we're going to evict uh, these green lines by performing different loads that goes into the same cache set. So we are uh, progressively feeding this cache set 
until we have evicted the data that we wanted to evict. Then we can reload it again from the DRAM and so on until we have our pit flips. So it looks quite simple. We just on a series of different uh, accesses, but it's actually not that simple we, because um, we have the replacement policy of the CPU cache that plays an important role here. It says what is the next line to be, to be evicted to make room, make room for a new one. And on modern CPUs, it's not LRU. So we actually had to find uh, cache eviction strategies. And in this case, it's actually better to perform multiple access to the same address and it leads to better eviction. So using this, we found a really fast and effective eviction strategy on Haswell that led to an eviction rate of more than 99.97%, but we actually wanted like really the best one, uh, so the fastest and also the best eviction rate. So we evaluated more than 10,000 different strategies uh, to find the best one. And we managed to um, have this um, hammering with cache eviction on Haswell. So here you can see in blue, uh, you have the original uh, attack, so we see a flush uh, in native um, environment, uh, native code. Um, and then in green, you have the uh, still in native code, but with eviction, so with no CL flush instruction. And what you can see is that we um, change the refresh interval in there. And basically, if your machine is vulnerable to the attack with the CL flush, then it's likely vulnerable to the attack uh, without CL flush because it starts at the same refresh interval. So it's a bit less speed flips, but likely it will still work. Now with JavaScript, uh, we have a bit less speed flips again, uh, and the, it, it works with a bigger refresh interval, but still we manage to have speed flips, and actually the higher the interval, then uh, it, it matters a bit less. We have pretty much as many bit flips as with the original attack. So the third uh, technique is hammering with non-temporal accesses. So non-temporal accesses are when you access data basically just once and not in the immediate future. So there is no real need to put it in the cache because you will just evict data that was actually important and it will have some cache pollution. So there are non-temporal accesses instruction that basically bypass the cache. Um, these non-temporal stores, uh, the problem is that um, when you perform non-temporal stores to one address, they are all combined in this write combining buffer. And only the last write goes to the DRAM. So no matter how many um, stores you do to the same address, you will have only one write in the end. So the rate will not be sufficient. So the trick by uh, Xiao et al. was actually to follow this non-temporal store uh, to a cache access to the same address. So basically it looks like this, you will have these uh, different axes, so these two axes to X and Y, with this move uh, NTI, so move non-temporal, and then it's followed by a regular move that will put data into the cache, and then you have this loop. So it's just really this tiny loop. And the fourth uh, different access technique is hammering with uncached memory because just sometimes everything fails. And this was the case, especially on mobile devices. Every, um, this, this, all these three techniques all failed. Uh, so in ARM v7, the flush instruction is privileged, so it won't work. Uh, cache eviction, we tried a lot, but it, all the time it's just too slow to have any bit flips. And on ARM v8, uh, the non-temporal store are actually still cached in practice. So again, um, no bit flips possible there. Um, but since Android 4, um, there is ION, that is the memory management, and the apps can use this interface, they have ION, uh, to have uncached and physically contiguous memory. Um, so it's also not privileged, and there is no permission needed uh, to access this interface. So this is what uh, Van der Vin et al. used to have these speed flips on uh, Android. Okay, so the next question is how do we uh, target uh, accesses? How do we perform accesses to specific DRAM rows. Now we talked about uh, accessing um, data that is not in the cache but in the DRAM, but now we want to access uh, specific locations in the DRAM. And uh, we know that there is a fixed map between uh, physical addresses and DRAM cells, um, but this mapping is undocumented uh, for Intel processors, and it has been reverse engineered by Mark Seaborn in 2015 for uh, one configuration of, uh, of Sandy Bridge uh, laptops. And uh, we then um, 
went on from there and we reverse engineered it for many different configurations on Sandy Bridge, Ivy Bridge, Haswell, Skylake, uh, Broadwell, um, also on ARM CPUs. And we exploit the timing difference here between a row hit and a row conflict. Uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, if we can see a row conflict for two addresses, for an address pair, then we know that they must map to the same bank but to a different row. So we know that they actually go to the same chip and then we can target addresses that go to the same bank but to different rows. How do I reverse my own DRAM? So there's this uh, drama repository that we have on GitHub. You can just uh, clone the code from there and uh, then you run it with uh, sudo because you need access to the uh, page map and uh, then you give it like 50% uh, percent of your physical memory and then you're looking for something like maybe 16 sets. Uh, on my machine I have 32, but I, I expect that it at least finds 16. Um, it's okay to put a smaller number there. Um, and then once you have the functions from this tool, you will put these functions into the RowHammer.js tool. We have a native code tool in there, um, and then you just run make uh, for instance, this was for Ivy Bridge, make Ivy or make Rowhammer Ivy. And then you run it again with sudo for the page map. It need, only needs sudo for the page map access because that was uh, Google's patch uh, last year, how they prevented uh, the um, attack on, uh, on, on current systems. And then minus D2 for two dims. If you have a different number of dims, you have to put a different number there. And then you can optimize the attack speed a bit by putting F0 here, which says I only want to take zero as the first offset uh, for every row that I want to uh, hammer. Okay, let's see that in a demo. I have prepared something here, a short video where I run this. So I first go to the reverse engineering folder, then I run the uh, measure tool. Uh, I uh, so I use 50% of DRAM. The more I use, the better, but actually recording the video was not possible with <laughs> allocating more DRAM. And uh, so I'm, I'm now uh, generating all these sets. So it looks for sets of addresses that, uh, this does not look very nice, but it looks for sets of addresses which have um, a row conflict. So once it has found uh, 16 sets, we will, uh, it, it runs a simple um, algorithm to figure out which is the minimal conflict set here, so which must be the bits that um, lead to this, um, to this uh, bank mapping, to these conflicts. Now we will check whether the same functions are already written in the Rohammer uh, source code, and there we can see, okay, 14, 18 is the same, 15, 19 is also the same, 16, 20 is the same, 17, 21 is also the same. Here's a small difference. I don't expect that it makes a difference, but still it's better to just copy the value that we have just recovered. We could also add the bit 6 here. Uh, the, that would probably also improve our results because that is what the hardware just told us, the functions that the hardware just told us uh, that are used. So if I now run the Rowhammer tool, I have to again, so I have to first uh, call make Rowhammer Ivy for my Ivy Bridge system, and uh, then I can run the Rowhammer tool, but I have to run it with sudo um, so that I have access to the physical address, addresses. There are also attacks to recover physical address information without sudo access, uh, but for the sake of simplicity here, it is not implemented in this way. And now, you have seen I ha didn't have any bit flips when I hammered a single row, but now I specified only one offset per row, and uh, I have hundreds and thousands of bit flips here. So you can see every, all of the long lines here, that is each, every time is one bit flip. So yeah, this will continue like this forever. So many, many bit flips. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So, the next question, how do we exploit random bit flips? Because this looks all very random. Yeah, some bit will flip somewhere. Actually, they are not random. They are not random at all. They are highly reproducible. Once you hammer a memory location, uh, there, the chance that you will flip a bit in the same location as you, where you've flipped it before uh, is extremely high. So this is very reproducible. So what you can do is uh, you just say, OK, this is sort of a uh, set one bit to zero uh, gadget. And I can use that to set some memory location that I usually couldn't write to set a bit to zero. 
So what I do is I, I uh, choose a data structure where I can exploit such a write one bit uh, gadget, then I scan for good bit flips in my memory, and then I place the data structure at that location, and then I trigger the bit flip again. And now there are several different techniques to uh, follow this uh, general attack strategy. And I would say this is a form of a post row hammer exploitation. The first strategy that we want to talk about is the one that was presented by Seaborn and Dulian to escape from the Google uh, NACL sandbox. And there they exploited that x86 opcodes have a variable length and uh, sometimes unsafe opcodes that are not allowed by the sandbox are uh, contained in uh, more longer multibyte uh, opcodes. And this is not a problem as long as you can only jump to validated offsets in the code. But once you have uh, corrupted a jump, you might be able to jump to a, a non-aligned address uh, into an opcode and then use a syscall opcode to escape from the sandbox. So uh, with this, they flipped a bit in a validated NACL instruction sequence and then they had the capability of an arbitrary jump and could do anything in the sandbox. Uh, the next um, group of attacks exploits page table entries. And probably some of you already know page table entries. So here you have a present bit, whether it's valid, read-write bit, user access bit, write-through, uncacheable, reference, dirty. Uh, this is the size bit, the global bit, and here we have the execution disable bit, the NX bit. And uh, then if you, if you look, so this is a huge entry, it's 64 bits. Some of these bits are ignored. If we have a bit flip there, the processor just doesn't care. Perfect. And then we have the physical page number. So chances are very high that we hit a physical page number. And also, every four kilobyte page table contains exactly 512 of such entries. So it scales in the same way. How are they used when we want to map our virtual address space? So here I have a virtual address space on the left, and it directly goes to those page table entries. And these page table entries map in some random way uh, to the physical pages that we have here. And uh, in this physical memory, we also have a kernel page here. Uh, the page table is also stored in physical memory, and that is all neighboring in, in DRAM. Not a problem so far, because you cannot access it, right? But with, uh, if we have some way to manipulate one of our own page table entries, let's say I can manipulate page table entry zero, and I can modify the address and say I want to have it mapped to my own page table, then I can modify any of the page table entries on, of, of this page table. So for instance, now I could modify page table entry one and scan through the physical memory and search for interesting pages. Like here, a kernel page. This looks interesting. Let's change it, because we can now. We have kernel privileges if we have access to our own page table. We can access and modify every physical memory location. So how do we do that now in an, in an attack? So we start with a search for a bit flip. So we will hammer different locations. And once we have found a location where a bit flips, uh, we will just uh, release this memory page and allocate pages uh, that we want to, uh, where we want to flip a bit. So here we have the green page, which is the target page, a page table. And here I have the example again, and now most of the memory is filled with page tables, but there is still one user page here and a kernel page here, and uh, this is my own page table. And what happens now if I flip a bit? The probability that I'm just point uh, the, the, that the page table entry points to just some page table afterwards is very high because I filled the entire uh, physical memory or almost the entire physical memory with page tables. So then I have access to one of my own page tables and then I can run the same exploitation technique as before. So the strategy here is we scan for bit flips, we exhaust or massage memory to place a page table at the target location, and then we flip the bit and gain access to our own page table and have kernel privileges. Perfect. So this idea was uh, originally mentioned by uh, Seaborn and Dulian. Uh, they ran, they uh, pro proposed this attack technique uh, for their Rowhammer attack, but the same idea was also applied in Rowhammer JS, uh, in one bit flops, one cloud flops, uh, on Xen uh, PVM, and in Drammer on uh, Android. So 
post rowhammer exploitation yes this is all post rowhammer exploitation we are we are talking about what do we do once we can flip a bit and uh, once we uh, have access to our own page table and there are many things that we can do if we can scan and modify the entire physical memory so this is really fast scanning to, through the entire physical memory um, you can modify binary pages that are executed in root privileges, you can modify credential structs, you can read keys, crypto keys from the DRAM, you can corrupt RSA signatures, you can modify certificates or configurations, and uh, scanning through the entire memory and finding one specific page sounds like a bit, okay, but you would have false positives, right? No, this is a four kilobyte page. Uh, this is 32,000 bits. This is pretty unique. If you find this, these 32,000 bits somewhere, it's exactly what you were looking for. There is one case where we might have multiple copies of um, pages uh, in the DRAM, and in this case we, can, we, we might have uh, page deduplication to uh, eliminate th those copies. Uh, page deduplication, so we, if we want to do a row hammer attack with page deduplication, we again start with a uh, bit flip in the beginning, and then we have a uh, target page here that we want to attack, and now we just produce the same predictable content on our own modifiable page. Then the operating system or hypervisor searches for duplicate pages and at some point it will compare those two green pages and will find it's, they are equivalent. And then it will deduplicate the uh, one page to the other. Um, and then we just hammer again, flip again, and we have our bit flip there. So the strategy here is we scan for, flip, for bit flips, we place the content for deduplication so that the flip can be exploited, and then we perform the bit change through Rowhammer. And this idea was uh, presented by Bosman um, in their SNP paper to change a data type in JavaScript and then to change a pointer to a good object to, um, to a pointer to a counterfeit object that they injected. And then uh, again in uh, the work by Razavi et al, uh, they corrupted authori the authorized keys file on Linux so that you could log in with uh, manipulated R uh, um, RSA, SSH keys. Um, and they also corrupted the Debian update URLs. You know that they are just stored in plain text and then you have a bit flip there and then they registered the domain and uh, then they also flipped the bit in the public key file, uh, factorized the key because they know it, because it's a deduplicated page, they can read it. Uh, so uh, they were able to uh, slip in malicious updates there. So the next question would be, how do we mitigate Rowhammer? Yes, because this is just all bad right now, right? Uh, so different mitigations have been proposed with different goals and different expectations. So uh, first, there are some mitigations that seek to detect Rohama, others seek to prevent Rohama. There are some that are done in software, other in hardware. Uh, also here, it's like a hardware problem, so it's not really easy to solve. So some solutions aim at finding a short-term solution, even if we don't have the good theorem. Others try to find some more long-term solution uh, to really fix the problem. So immediately after um, the original paper and also after um, the Google exploits, uh, then there were a handful quick fixes. What can we do right now to fix the problem? Uh, the first idea was to stop using the CL flush instruction, and this is actually what Google did for the uh, Chrome sandbox. Uh, the thing is that quickly after we showed that yes, you can actually still do the attack uh, even without the CL flush instruction, so it's still not really solved. Um, the other idea was to increase the refresh rate. Um, the idea is that basically the more you increase it, the less you are susceptible to have bit flips because then you have less time to perform these memory accesses and you have then less bit flips. Uh, the thing is that Kim et al showed that, uh, at least for this, their testbed, you would need to increase by seven times uh, this refresh rate to eliminate all bit flips. Uh, and the implementation was not uh, that high because it also is a problem of power consumption here and also it slows down uh, the theorem so it's not so good if you increase it too high and the implementation was uh, that BIOS vendor did increase the um, uh, refresh rate by two times. So you see it's maybe good for some theorem but not for all of them, most likely. The other thing that uh, people were looking for is ECC. So when you have ECC protection, normally the server can handle or correct single bit errors. So it sounds like the solution. Uh, actually, it's not really the solution because it never has been done for uh, these targeted bit flips, but just for random bit flips. 
Also, there is no real standard for event reporting. Uh, so, Mark Lantern did a really nice white paper uh, and then tried to compare what really happens uh, when we have these bit flips on ECC DRAM. So, the common practice is that uh, servers count the ECC errors and report them to the OS only if they reach a certain threshold, uh, which is usually, and again, there is no standard for that, usually uh, more than 100 bit flips per hour. So here you can see that you have some margin uh, to perform the attack because it's not going to be instant. The reporting is not too going to be instant. Uh, but even more bad, uh, some server vendors just never reported the errors to the OS. So apparently it's okay, you can perform these bit flips, it's supposed to be protected against this corruption, but it's not really because uh, the OS never sees these errors. And actually, even one server did not even halt when bit flips were non-correctable. So apparently, um, server vendors have different expectations of what ECC protection actually means here. Um, so the next idea was, okay, if we can't really have these quick fixes, then maybe we can detect the attacks. That would be better no than nothing. And the thing is that Rohama uh, causes a lot of cache misses and cache uh, hits and that they all can be monitored with hardware performance counters. And this was the original idea of uh, Herat and Fork at uh, Black Hat 2015, and then we also did a follow-up work at Chepeta et al, and Paya also did a follow-up work. And th so this is our result, so different techniques have been done, so either using a sort of threshold or some kind of machine learning. So we just use the threshold um, on cache misses and cache hits that were normalized by uh, events on the instruction TLB. And you can see that here you have all these three uh, benign applications, so Firefox, some game, and stress on the memory. And you can see that you can still have a clear threshold with flush and reload, which is an attack on the cache, and also Rohama. And that basically, if you put a threshold around here, then you can detect cache attacks and Rohama with that. Um, so in terms of ideas also, um, Kimet Al had this bunch of maybe we can do that, but it's probably not going to solve anything. Um, so in their or original paper, they said, okay, we should uh, also make better DRAM chips that are not vulnerable, but probably not happening. Uh, using error correcting codes, we just talked about that, doesn't really work. Increasing the refresh rate, same. Uh, remapping or retiring faulty cells after manufacturing, what happens if your whole DRAM is vulnerable? and identifying hammered rows at runtime and refreshing uh, the neighbors, uh, which would need like really a lot of, um, it's really expensive in terms of hardware. So all these solutions are not really practical. They're either expensive, uh, cause huge performance overheads or increased power consumption, which is something that nobody wants. They had another idea, which is called PARA, uh, for probabilistic adjacent row activation. And the idea is that when one row is closed, uh, then each time one adjacent row is going to be opened, but with a very low probability. And the idea is that Rohama, we have one row that is open and closed, but a really high number of times. So if you have this very low probability uh, for a high number of times, then statistically the number of rows are going to be refreshed, and there is going to be no bit flips there. Uh, so the implementation is at the memory control level, so this is not something that you can just implant, uh, implement on your own. But the advantage is that it's completely stateless. Uh, there is no need for hardware that counts which row is going to be refreshed, so it's really not expensive. And basically for this very low probability and a high number of um, hammering, um, the probability of experiencing just one error in one year is extremely low, this probability. Okay, so uh, for other countermeasures, um, in the DDR4 standard, for instance, uh, there was a discussion whether they would include the target row refresh. Target row refresh is also a very simple idea. You have a counter per row and you inc increment uh, the neighbor rows for every access that you perform. And when the, refresh, uh, when, the, when the counter reaches a threshold, the row will be refreshed. For instance, the middle one reaches the threshold first and then the outer ones also uh, reach the threshold and then all of them are refreshed over time. So no bit can flip again. Um, recently on the Linux kernel mailing list, uh, Corbe suggested that, uh, that they could include a no hammer kernel module. And the idea is, um, so we don't have any bit flips if we have eight times the refresh rate, right? So the idea is to uh, only allow one eighth of the maximum of cache misses 
and with that old also only one eighth of the maximum number of DRAM accesses. And they would measure that using the performance monitoring um, system of modern Intel CPUs, which is also maybe uh, not the best idea to do, to do that. Uh, but let's go for it. So if we now hammer one memory location in one bank, uh, then the um, no hammer kernel module would notify, uh, would notice that and uh, would uh, then uh, notify the kernel that it has to halt the execution because the threshold was reached. So we wait for the refresh for the rest of the 64 milliseconds. So this is good if we have a case like here where we hammer the uh, where we hammer a memory location, but it's bad if we have a case like uh, this one where we access different memory locations and then again uh, we reach the number of cache misses and then we have to um, halt the system again for the next 64 millisecond interval. A different approach is to just attack, uh, stop the attacks before they uh, actually happen. So we do static analysis on binaries, so before they are shipped to the customers, uh, we det detect suspicious instruction sequences, uh, CL flush, RDTSC, fences. But here the problem is, uh, like Rohammer.js can just perform a, a sequence of memory accesses to perform this attack. So Mascat also tries to uh, cover that by detecting uh, weird memory access patterns. Uh, one problem here, uh, these weird memory access patterns could also come from perfectly benign uh, memory loads, uh, like computer games. So we have the problem of false positives, and you probably all know if there are many false positives in any system, uh, you're probably stopping to use it. Like a virus scanner that uh, alerts you uh, with false positives 10 times per day, you wouldn't use it. So let's go for the next one, Envil. Uh, Envil was suggested by Avekedal, and they also want to use the performance counters to first detect row hammer, and then they activate the neighbor rows to prevent bit flips. But they only do that uh, after they detected that an attack is ongoing. So it's similar as TRR, but it's in software. Uh, so here we hammer two locations, and the red ones are in danger of flipping a bit. So we refresh them, and then they are fine again. More recently, there was uh, the CAT paper, uh, which uh, presents several nice ideas. Um, the first is uh, the uh, BCAT variant, which uh, disables vulnerable physical memory in the bootloader. Um, so uh, I will come to that in a minute. First, uh, GCAT, this is the one that works at runtime. And here the idea is that we isolate uh, security domains in physical memory based on the potential vulnerability. So here in GCAT, you can see that I have a blue, a green, and a yellow uh, page, so different security domains. So if I want to um, have these different security domains in my systems, I have to isolate them, so I have to leave a gap there. For BCAT, I would just disable the vulnerable memory locations. But as you have seen just before in the live demo, if I would run BCAT on my system, I probably would have one megabyte of RAM left that is not vulnerable out of the 16 gigabytes. So, what is the conclusion to this? Uh, Rohammer attacks are incredibly easy to mount. You can all do that. You just clone the tools from GitHub and uh, off you go with the uh, bit flips. Um, so, the attacks work on most systems. Uh, the fact that we are not sure whether they work on some specific systems, like we, we thought they don't work on DDR4, or there are still many laptops where we couldn't r have a bit flip yet. Uh, the problem here is that we might not just uh, know the right DRAM mapping functions. If we use the wrong DRAM mapping functions, we did that on DDR4 at first, we hammered a DDR4 system for uh, several weeks non-stop, and no bit flip, not a single bit. Then we reverse engineered the functions, and we had the first bit flip after 12 seconds. So this is really essential to use the right functions, else you won't see a bit flip on your system. But if you use them, then uh, it's not a problem. It's easy to, to do. And then we have the problem of the countermeasures. Most of them are just too expensive or ineffective, and you don't want to deploy a countermeasure and then figure out um, a month later that, yeah, it really does nothing as suspected. Um, okay, 
So, if you want to try that, I hope you all got uh, an appetite for trying this on your own now. And uh, here we have the links, so the drama repository, you should start with that, reverse engineer your DRAM, figure out what the functions are, then put the functions into rowhammer.js and run the native tool, the double-sided hammering tool, and have some bit flips on your system. Um, you can also try it on ARM, so we have the libflush, which provides you uh, with eviction strategies and uh, ways to call flush instructions on uh, ARM platforms. So this is a, this is a platform in independent way of uh, doing flush and reload or evict and reload. And also the uh, DRAMer repository by VUSEC. This is also a very nice start if you want to do uh, hammering with ION on ARM. So. Thank you for your attention. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us, uh, you can do that via Twitter or via email. And uh, thank you for, for your attention. <laughs>